Hoshana Rabba is day number 51. It's the 51st day of Teshuvah, of, of judgment that we started in the month of Elul. So here we are at the finish line. And many people always ask, I don't understand. We have Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is what? Thank you. <coughs> Rosh Hashanah is Judgment Day. Yom Kippur is the day everything is sealed. So what does Rosh Hashanah Rabbah have to do with anything? Where, where did Rosh Hashanah Rabbah come from? What's significant about it? What, what kind of impact does it have on my life? So I want to share with you a very small mashal that can maybe give us a better perspective on this matter. There was several Jewish families that got together. They decided they wanted to live in a remote city away from all the noise and the balagan. So they all moved together to a certain neighborhood, stress-free, beautiful homes, low taxes. But the problem was, no Jewish community yet. No shul, no bataknezet. So these individuals were not able to raise funds to build a, a bataknezet, a shul. So they decided they're going to get a temporary housing unit that would be shipped in, ready-made, and placed on a property that they purchased. Something simple, tzanua. Okay, Baruch Hashem, the big day comes. A truck brings this housing unit. There's a large crane that starts lifting up this house off the truck and slowly but surely is putting it down on the property. There's eight huge workers, two guys on each corner that are there trying to direct the house into exactly the, the spot that it has to go to. They're moving it one foot here, five inches there, 10 inches here. For 20, 30 minutes, these eight guys are trying to maneuver this housing unit while it's in the air to make sure when they put it down, it goes in the right spot. And Bemet, Baruch Hashem, mission accomplished. They guide it to the right position. Everyone starts clapping. Everyone's all excited. And now comes along the electricians and the plumber. They get everything set up. Baruch Hashem, the shul is ready to be used. The committee is all proud of themselves. And they call up the rabbi. Kodarav, rabbi, please come check out our new shul. We want you to see it. The rabbi comes in. Everyone's all excited to see his reaction. He walks into this new housing unit. And in three seconds, he gives him this semi-dirty look. Ah, <laughs> rabbi, what happened? And the rabbi says, Rabbutai, I warned you 10 times. We have to pray towards the east. Why did you put the housing unit where the Arona Kodesh is going to be facing the west? You put it in the wrong direction. Ma'asitem, what did you do? And the president looks at the vice president and he blames him and the treasurer and this guy. Everyone's blaming each other. And comes along a Chacham. This wise guy says, hey, hey, everyone, calm down. Why don't we get those eight guys, those eight strong guys that were working here, let's ask them to turn it around. We'll put it back in the position you wanted, Rabbi, no problem. They look at this guy and say, Habib, are you serious? When the housing unit was in the air, we're able to tilt it and move it around. Once they put it down, and especially when they put in the pipes and the electrical units, it's already too late. It is what it is. Moray the Rabutai, Elul, Rosh Hashanah, 
Everything was hanging in the air. A person's livelihood, his parnasa, health, everything is in the air. Comes along Yom Kippur, it's already set down. They put it down onto the ground. They seal it, quote unquote. But Oshana Rabba, Morai Rabutai, they're putting in the pipes and they're putting together electricity. Before they finish the piping, we can still try to maybe make some changes and, 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 and maneuver things around. But once that's done, it's very difficult to make any more changes. That's the power of Rabutai of Oshana Rabba. Even if Chaz Shalom, Chachamim tell us, God forbid something negative was sealed on Yom Kippur, Hoshana Rabbah, we have the opportunity, we have that last second chance to make a change before all is said and done. To make you understand this a little better, I'll give you another example. A very interesting story. There was a little boy, a little boy that the Tsarin Arab, unfortunately, when he was four or five years old, his father passed away. Shem Then, when he was about eight or nine years old, his mother suddenly passed away. So we have a yatom, a complete yatom, an orphan. No father, no mother. He's only nine years old. His mother's buried at Shem And now, there's a shiva, the seven days of mourning. And the family is debating who's going to adopt the child. No father, no mother. Who's taking the child in? Who's going to become his new parents? So the brother of the father, the uncle of the boy says, listen, I'll take care of him. I have a nice big house. I'll give him his own room. I'll make him feel at home. I'll give him the love and care that he needs. Let me adopt the child. Then comes along the sister of the mother, the aunt of the boy. La, I'll adopt the child. I know exactly how his mother used to run the house. I'll give him that same love and warmth. I'll make him feel at home. He'll think I'm his mother. That's how good I'm going to be with him. Comes along the older brother, of this same child. He's like, he's a rabotai. Libi upsari. Who, he, he is me. He is my flesh and blood. I should be adopting the child. So you have the brother of the father, the sister of the mother, and the actual brother of the eight-year-old boy, the nine-year-old boy. Back and forth discussions. Everyone's arguing. Everyone wants to take the boy. The rabbi says, rabotai, let the brother take him in. That's Mamash, his flesh and blood. He should adopt the child. Okay, everyone agrees. That's what the Chacham says. No problem. And by the older brother takes in this boy into his house and raises him as his own child. It's his brother. Raise him as his own child. Send him to good schools. And Mifanek him with all the good stuff and toys and food and a nice beautiful room and an environment. Everything is Baruch Hashem great. Comes time for Shiduchim. It's time to marry off his adopted child that happens to be his brother. This girl doesn't work out. That girl doesn't work out. Dates this one for five months and breaks off. This one doesn't go well. It goes on for years. He's unable to find a Shiduch. No Shiduch! comes along the same rabbi of the community and he tells, he tells the older brother, the adopting father, the father, the new father of the child, I have an idea. Don't get angry at me. It's just an idea out of left field. If you don't like it, pretend I never said it. Okay, Claude Arav, what is it? Let me hear. So listen, you're trying to find a shidduch for your youngest brother. You're having a hard time. He's on the market for five years. Nothing's happened. I have a good idea. You have a daughter that's two years younger than him. You're struggling with her shidduch as well. 
Why can't your brother marry your daughter? That's a beautiful shidduch. In the old country, that was very common. That family members got married with each other. Right? It should be a perfect shidduch. They know each other. You'll be the father-in-law of this boy, the adopted father of this child, and the brother of this child. Couldn't get better than that, right? He says, you know what? I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Let me discuss it with my wife. Speaks with his wife, tells her the idea. His wife says, you know what? He really is a good boy. Baruch Hashem, he has good midot. Let's discuss with our daughter. They go, they discuss with their daughter. She hears it, she's thinking about it. And after a while, she says, you know what? I'll give it a shot. And Bemet, here you have this boy dating his. I guess it turned out to be his niece. And Baruch Hashem, they're connecting very nicely with each other. After a short time, the younger brother comes through, the older brother, his potential father-in-law. He said, I need a ring. Can you help me buy a ring for your daughter? Don't worry, I got your back. They go to 47th Street to check out some rings. Baruch Hashem, he gets a beautiful ring. And lo and behold, they get engaged. They get engaged to get married. The wedding itself, Moray Rabutai, lavish, beautiful wedding. Call it the wedding of the century. Everyone's there. It was beautiful, very fancy. And everyone talked about the wedding. This father of the bride and brother of the groom, he made sure it's going to be mamash, high class. The wedding is over. Sheva Bachon is beautiful. A couple of months after the wedding, the husband and wife have their first argument. Okay, they have an argument, they get over it. Another argument, they semi get over it. A third argument, they got very ugly. Next thing you know, the girl comes over to her parents and starts complaining about her husband. The father hears this very uncomfortable situation. It's his daughter and it's also his brother. What do you do in this case? So the family politics gets very complicated in this situation. Whatever the case may be, he makes shalom bite between all of them. Some more time goes by, another machloka, another argument, another fight, back and forth, and she comes back to her parents and he goes here and there. Things got so ugly that one day, the kala, the bride, the, 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 the daughter, she comes to her parents' home, she says, enough, I can't handle this, dad, mom, I want out of this relationship. The father of the girl calls his younger brother and says, listen, I want to talk to you for a minute. He speaks to them very sternly. And he says, Habibi, I want to get taken care of by tomorrow morning. I don't want to hear anything anymore. I gave you all these chances. This relationship is over. Get out of my house. The younger brother's crying, but wait, what? Out of my house, it's over. You're mistreating her, not meant to be. Out of the house. The boy, Bermet, leaves the house, starts crying. Where's he going to go? No father, no mother. He, he, he's basically on his own. He waits a couple of days, and he comes knocking back on his brother's door. The brother opens the door, sees his face. He's like, get out of here. He's like, no, but wait. Get out. No, please, I beg of you. Just give me two minutes of your time. Chai, what do you want? He tells him as follows. He says, I, eh. he says, I know. It's true, Emet. It's true she's your sister. I know, excuse me, that she is your daughter. I know she's your daughter, and you love her. But please don't forget that I'm your brother. Give me one more chance. The brother hears this, contemplating back and forth, and he repeats himself. I know she's your daughter, but I'm your brother. I'm your flesh and blood. We have the same father and mother. And he repeats it again. I know she's your daughter, but I'm your brother. 
Just give me one last chance. And Bahamut, the older brother gets very touched. He said, I'm giving you one last chance. I'm speaking to my daughter. We're going to work it out. Baruch Hashem. They got back together and they lived a beautiful marriage life. Moraita Rabutai, Rosh Hashanah, Judgment Day, Yom Kippur, the seal. When our Neshama goes up to Shamaim, our soul goes up to Shamaim, to heavens. Sometimes it tells the Kadosh Bachu, enough is enough. I can't handle this body anymore. Lazy, always angry. His eyes are wandering around. The mouth is rattling things off. He can't control himself. I don't want to be part of this body anymore. And if chas v'shalom, someone gets a seal that the betin upstairs says it's over. Please don't come back. You're not coming back to this world. And oh, enough is enough. We have a shana rabba moray v'rabutai. Where we tell HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we're reading Slichot, we're going to make a whole thing over here. It's like we said throughout the month of Elul, HaNeshama Lach, Ve'aguf Pao Lach, Chus Alamalach. We're telling God, I know the Neshama is yours. It's a chelik of Hashem, it's a spirit. It's part of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But keep in mind Hashem, HaGuf Pao Lach, the body is also made by you. I know she's your daughter, but I am your brother. Please, give us one last chance. No one over here has a clue what was judged, what was sealed. So tonight, Moray Rabutai, as we were asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we're telling God, I am a part of you. The Neshama definitely is, but the body is also part of you. Give me one last chance. It's a very powerful evening, a very powerful night. So, maybe one or two tips of what we could do. Bezrat Hashem, that if God forbid we are not in the right side of the judgment, that we could hopefully be in We could hopefully sweeten the judgment. I'll give you one or two pointers. There is a story of a couple. Call them Shimon and Sarah. Shimon and Sarah go on a beautiful vacation. They go, nice hotel, beautiful view, five star, the whole nine yards. What happens is, during the vacation, they have a little, a little argument. Back and forth, this and that, and they don't talk to each other for one of those days. As they're walking, Outside, not talking to each other, Shimon notices a little sandbox where kids were playing in a park. So the husband, Shimon, takes a piece of wood and he starts engraving in the sand. My wife got me very upset. We're not talking to each other. I'm very hurt. And he puts an exclamation point. His wife walks over to see what it says, and she shrugs her shoulders and walks away. Doesn't bother me. Chai. A few days later, everything is already calm. They get along again, Baruch Hashem. And the husband feels a little sick. He's not feeling too well. Not feeling good. What happens is, his wife takes care of him, makes some delicious chicken soup, and she makes sure that he's taken care of. She doesn't bother him. She helps him with all his needs. And when they take a little walk that night, they walk by a large stone. It's a huge stone. And Shimon, the husband, sees this. And he takes out of his pocket his keys. And he starts engraving in the stone. My wife took care of me so nicely today. I was sick and she cooked and she this and she that. He wrote a whole Megillat is there engraved in the stone. His wife looks at it. She's like, wow. She says, tell me, I don't, I, what are you doing? You know, last time you started writing things in the sand. Today you write things in the stone. Like, what are you doing? I mean, what's the point of doing this? What's going on in your head? So the husband tells his wife as follows. 
He said, I want you to know, when we have arguments, I want it to be, quote unquote, written on sand. This way, a simple wind could wipe off everything I wrote. Someone could walk by, give it a little kick, and nothing is remembered anymore. But when it comes to something good you did for me, I want it to be engraved in stone. So it's never going to be forgotten. I should always have a karata tov. Moray v'rabotai, kol ha-ma'avir ha-midotav. Anyone that is forgiving, anyone that says, you know what, chai, it happened, forgive and forget. Don't hold a grudge. Don't hold things in your heart and try to harm him or harm her or try to get revenge on him or her. Try to what, Moray v'rabotai, the bad times. Try to have it written and sent so you can easily forgive the person. And the good times, have it engraved in a stone so that you don't forget. Always have a karate tov. One thing we could take upon ourselves tonight, Hoshana Rabbah, Morai Rabbutai, learn how to forgive. Mechila. It could be your father, your mother, it could be your wife, your husband, it could be your children, it could be your neighbor, it could be your coworker, it could be anyone. Don't hold a grudge. When a person is willing to forgive, in Shamaim, it makes a tremendous rash. Thunderous sounds in Shamaim for your benefit. If a person is able to forgive and forget, Rabotai, it's an unbelievable zgula. Unbelievable thing for you and your family. So if there's one thing we can do tonight, not to be makpid, particular about everything. He said, she said, he did, he started, but it's his fault, their fault. Don't be, don't be so particular. Let a basic win get rid of it. Forget about it. That's number one. It is a second tip. It is a second tip I can give you for tonight. It will be a story that's brought down in the Gemara. Beautiful story. Morai v'rabotai. There were two great Chachamim. Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Chiyah Barabah. They were walking from one city to the next city. They were walking from Tveria to Tzipori. As they're walking, Rabbi Yochanan pointed to a field. Just imagine there's two great sages. Imagine you have Rav Yashiv walking with Rav Ovadi Yosef together. Right? You have the Chafetz Chaim walking together with the Ben Chai. Or you have, you know, the Rambam and the Ramban or whatever it is. Great sages walking together. Unbelievable. Here you have these two great sages walking together. And Rav Yochanan stops. And he points at a field. And he tells his colleague, he says, oh, you see that field? That used to be my field. I used to own it. Like, really? So what happened? Oh, I sold it. Why? So I could learn Torah all day long. I didn't have enough money, so I had to sell the field. Okay. They walk a few more minutes. They reach an olive grove. You know, olives, you can make a lot of money selling olive oil. And Rav Yochan stops. Hey, you see this field? So Rav Chia says, yeah, what about it? You know, that used to be my field too. That used to be yours. Yeah, what'd you do? Like, oh, I sold it. Why? I had no money. I wanted to learn Torah, so I, I, I had to sell it for, you know. Okay, Rav Chia said, Beseda. And then they pass by a vineyard. And Rav Yochan says, hey, Rav Chia, look, you see this field? What about it? This used to be mine. Get out of here, really. What happened? Don't even ask. I had no money left. And, you know, to support my wife and my kids, I wanted to learn Torah. So I, I sold the field. You know, it's like I continue learning Torah. Rav Chia is hearing all these real estate that he owned, that Rav Chia owned and sold for not necessarily the greatest price so he can continue learning Torah. He's like, who's guiding you with your business dealings here? He says, what are you going to do when you get older? Rav Chia starts crying. You're not going to have enough money when you're older, when you're zaken. What are you going to do then? What are you selling all your real estate for? Morai v'rabutai, Rav Chia, Ask this question of Yochanan. Look at how Yochanan answers him. Unbelievable thing. He says, My dear colleague, you're crying because I sold something that was created in six days 
and I bought something that was created in 40 days. Let me explain what that means. You're crying because I bought something that took 40 days to create and I sold something that took six days. HaKadosh Baruch created the whole world. The sun, the moon, the stars, all the plant life and animals. Everything was created in six days. So I took some fields. I sold it. For what? For Torah. The Torah, how long did it take for Hashem to bring it down to the world? Moshe Rabbeinu was there 40 days, 40 nights. Says Rabbi Yochanan, you're crying about that? I did the greatest deal in the world. As far as I'm concerned, what I did was considered a steal. I was able to sell all that land so I could learn many, many more years. That's the greatest bargain. I'm not telling anyone to sell the real estate, to sell their homes. But how many of us, I'm not giving no free commercials here. One second. How many of us, Morai Verabutai, how many of us are wasting, wasting so much time to make an extra dollar, to get an extra pleasure? We're wasting time on something that took six days to create, and we're pushing aside something that took 40 days to create. How many of us, myself included, are mevatel Torah, bitul Torah, bitul Torah because of nonsense? If we take this into account, like the Gaon of Vilna used to take every minute into account. I'm not telling you to become the Gaon of Vilna. Morai v'rabutai, do a cheshbon nefesh. Do an accounting of your life. If you look at your average Sunday, look at your average Sunday. Do you pray with a minyan? That's question number one. Question number two, you spend time working. If you don't work with your family, they're beautiful. And how much time on the television, on the computer? How much time on your phone? How much time Torah? Put a little scale and start analyzing where you're standing in life. Are we spending time we're putting our energy into something Hashem created in six days and we're ignoring the thing that took 40? This applies to men and women. There's Baruch Hashem, Shiurim, all over the place. If you live in our community, Baruch Hashem Chazak has lectures and programs for men, for women, for teenagers, public school students. If you're watching online, Baruch Hashem Hidabrut has lectures in so many different languages. And there's other great websites like Asia Torah and Torah Anytime. Oh, beautiful websites all over. Morai Verabutai, take advantage. Someone showed me just how the Hidabut operation works online. Hasle Beautiful. Let your friends know about it. How they're taking technology and they're bringing Torah to life. They're making it accessible to every single person around the world. In a, in a fashion that makes it very, it, it, it's enticing. You want to watch it. They can take a very boring lecture and make it look so beautiful with all the background effects that they do. Morai v'rabutai, take advantage. Come to shul, come to shiurim. If you can't come, you can watch these lectures on your phone, on the bus, in the doctor's office. You could be, whatever it is. Take advantage. And this is the Kabbalah, the acceptance that we should do tonight. Number one, ben adam lechavero, to work on how we are coordinating with one another, to learn how to forgive and forget, not to be makpid, and number two, not to waste our lives on something that was created in six days. Like we said before, Shana Rabbah is a very powerful night. The koch of Shana Rabbah, Morai Rabbotai, is unbelievable. So the housing units were hanging on Rosh Hashanah, it was set on Yom Kippur. The pipes are being put together tonight. The messengers are getting the, the pitka already. They're getting the, the, the envelope to take advantage. Ba'u Hashem, you have all night learning over here. Ba'u Hashem. Learn. Don't do bitul Torah. Don't talk to your friends. Politics, sports, leave that out. Today, keep it Kodesh Kodeshim. 
And when you pray in Shacharit and Musaf, Moray Rabutai, make sure you don't fall asleep. You're towards the end of the game. The fourth quarter is the most important time. You can't doze off in the fourth quarter. You know, Shacharit, Musaf especially, is the Chitum. It's when you have the final. So you got to make sure you're awake. And if you're falling asleep, ask your neighbor, the guy next to you, to wake you up. If he's falling asleep, then you wake him up. Right? Work together as a team. Some Chachamim would stand up for the whole prayers. When you stand up, I hope you don't fall asleep. You'll fall down. Right? So whatever it is, you find out your technique to remain alive and well and mamash erani. And Bezrat Hashem, Bizcharzeh, every single one of us should Bezrat Hashem be booked, sealed, in Chaim Tovim Bezrat Hashem, Chaim Meusharim Bezrat Hashem, Refua Shema, Panasatova, Vachen Yeratzon, Venomar Amen.